this is the third workshop in a series that was funded by the Urban Agenda, which is a state grant that the Franklin County CDC received to help the cities of Greenfield and North Adams. Um, and so we're very excited. It's been a year-long project of working with business owners, um, learning about what their needs are as far as succession planning, and these workshops are an outcome from that research. Um, we're fortunate to have Mark Abramson here from Greenfield, a realtor who is very well known in the commercial area, and Michael Van from the Pioneer Valley who has lots of experience in buying and selling and brokering um, and has will lead us off today on this. Well, welcome and thank you for, for having me. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. I am a principal of the Van Group. We are a strategic consulting and transactional advisory services firm uh, located in Springfield. We're a multi-generational family-owned business, so I'm in business with my father, my mother, my sister. Um, you know, we've been a very, very entrepreneurial family over our, our family history. We can trace our entrepreneurial roots back well over 150 years. Um, so the family's always been, been engaged not only in um, helping businesses, but also owning and operating a lot of different businesses. So we work with companies that are fall in fall into three different stages. They're either growth-oriented, you know, those who are looking at the, you know, how do we grow and scale our business. Other ones that we work with a lot are in the transition space. So these are companies that are typically looking at how are we going to transition our ownership sometime in the, the mid to near future, typically a three to five year window. A lot of times it's how am I going to transition to an employee, family member, or maybe I'm not so sure and I need to figure that piece out. And the third piece and where we're going to focus a lot of our attention today is on the exit side. We do a lot of M&A side work with companies that are interested in just getting out now. They've decided that it's time for me to sell my business or it's going to be in the next year or so. How do I get myself prepared for sale? How do I actually go about doing it? What we want to talk to you today, our objective really is to give you an overview of what it takes to be successful in having an exit, right? How could you be successful in selling your business? Because it's not an easy undertaking. You know, a lot of businesses that come to market don't sell. So how do we help you become more successful and what do we define as success for selling a business? And we have three basic definitions of that. One, we want you to be able to sell when you want to sell. There's nothing worse than having a, a short sale because circumstances have indicated that you have to sell. We want you to be able to sell to who you want to sell to because we want to be able to make sure our business is going to the right person, someone that we're comfortable with. Being able to sell to who we want to sell to is very, very important. And lastly, and most importantly for a lot of our owners is how much. How can we get what we want for our value so it meets our financial objectives for this business? What you'll find in most surveys and things is that the business uh, for about 84% of uh, business owners is the most important asset they have. You know, it's the largest asset they have. So creating, turning that into a liquid asset is very, very important because it's going to fund retirement, it's going to fund everything else they want to do in life. So being able to get what you need for value out of the company is very important. So when we start to talk exit timelines, you know, like, so we work with companies that are along the different spectrums and there's a range of things you're going to do at these different stages. So if you're looking at getting out in 10, 15 years or a longer term, you're going to do different things to position your business for sale than if you're looking at today where you're screaming, get me out today. So there's a million ways we could go about this topic of conversation because it's a very, very broad discussion as to how you sell your business. So what we've done is we've decided that we're going to start from a very specific standpoint, which is that the ideal time frame is when the market conditions are going to allow you to maximize the sale price. There's nothing worse than selling when the market is down. We don't get the numbers that we want to sell. We also want to sell to, we're going to assume, an unrelated third party. So we're not going to talk about, you know, if it's a family member or if it's an employee who are going to do special things to help them with. This is a very pure third party, someone we don't know. It could be a competitor. It could be someone walking off the street. It could be a financial buyer who's going to want to buy the business. And then we're going to make sure that we want to talk about someone who's qualified to buy the business. So that means someone who has the financial and operational capabilities to do so. Right? Perfect situation. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the timing and the buyer. Because timing is critical to a sale. And like any other business, you know, M&A has its own cycles. There are good times to sell a business, bad times to sell a business. Good times to buy, bad times to buy. And so the M&A cycle goes through these different stages. And right now we're in the midst of a very good cycle. This is a, an up cycle. It started in 2013, and they typically last three to five years. So that puts us somewhere in the, in the midpoint there, somewhere 2017, 2018. We're hoping that we're going to get to about 2019 for, for a run on this, on this market. And the market matters. And this is a, a great example of how the market drives multiples versus 
necessarily your company fundamentals. In 2005, the, the average multiple for a company, a mid-sized company, was five times. Two years later, it was a multiple of seven. What's the acronym EBITDA? Ah, good. So EBITDA is, is known as earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's a financial calculation that basically removes any of your, your capital structure from it to get to a true cash flow. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There's EBITDA that a lot of our financial and strategic buyers, our bigger buyers use. And then there's seller's discretionary earnings, which is EBITDA plus our owner's compensation. <coughs> and that's typically a number that our small business buyers look at because they're buying a job. So they're looking at, well, how much money can I truly get out of this, you know, versus an EBITDA calculation, which is more related to the financial return that I can generate. So those multiples though are very important because if we've got a million dollar EBITDA and it sells for five versus seven, that's a $2 million difference just because of market timing, market conditions. And, and that relates even when we have our smaller businesses. When the market's good, we get a higher multiple. Firstly, when the market goes bad, like in 2009, 2010, 2011, those multiples drop. So timing is very, very important, which asks, well, when's a good time to sell the business? And if we look at, this is the small business activity that we've seen, Biz Buy Sell, which is the largest listing site on the internet, it's used by most business brokers to list their companies for sale. Keeps track of all these great statistics, and they publish them on a quarterly basis. So you can see from over the past few years, we had an average sale price of one hundred eighty thousand dollars in two thousand thirteen. That's up to two hundred thousand now. So we've seen some nice appreciation. The number of transactions is growing. So how many companies were sold last year? We went from seven thousand to almost, you know, seventy nine hundred over that time period. So we're starting to see a nice trend in that market, which follows you know, that M&A cycle. The really exciting thing for us as intermediaries is what's going on presently in 2017. And this is a, a snapshot of 2017 first quarter activity. And the numbers that should jump at you is you see that number 2,368. It's a 29% increase in transactions over last first quarter. So that means we're really starting to see businesses sell. A lot of activity in the market. We're seeing the multiple go up which is good for us as sellers. And then we're seeing both the, the revenue of the companies that are selling and the cash flow selling, which means our companies are doing better. There's more confidence in our buyers, more confidence in our sellers. So it's a good, a very good market right now. And the stat that's really gonna jump at you is this number, 8%. So according to Biz Buy Sell, this is the gap between the average asking price and the average selling price. So in our world, that's almost equilibrium. You know, when we're at that close of a number, it means it's a really, really good market. Our buyers are being reasonable and our sellers are being reasonable. So good time to, to be in the market if you're gonna be in the market. So that leads us to the question of, well, how long is this market gonna run? If I'm thinking about selling, do I have the time to do it? And the question, you know, the simple answer is we don't know. But we have some idea as to what's gonna happen from a trend standpoint in the market. We know that inevitably there's gonna be a decline in M&A just because the cycle, cyclical business. But we also, there's some demographic realities that are starting to drive this activity that we're seeing right now. And this is a great snapshot of our, our world here. There are 2.7 million businesses in the United States owned by individuals over the age of 55. And when you ask them, when are they gonna sell? 48% said within five years. Right? I've seen that statistic as high as 60% and I've seen it as low as 35, 40%. But we know that at some point in reasonable time, a lot of our baby boomers are going to be selling. They're anticipating it. Now, five years is a perfect window for them because it's far enough to say yes <coughs> to sell, but close enough where they don't have to have to act on it. But that's a lot of businesses. And if you talk to them as to, well, do you have a plan on how you're going to do it? No. Only about 26% of business owners actually have a succession and transition plan for their business. So that means that they're just kind of winging it as to how they're going to sell. But they do have some very clear ideas as to how they're going to sell it. You know, it might be a family member, it could be an employee, it could be no idea. And then the ones we're really interested in though today are the 24% who think they're going to sell to a third party. Someone unrelated, someone who's going to walk into the door and say, I'm in love with your business, I want to own it. Those are the people that we want to talk about. So I always, I'm a numbers guy, so I like to add some clarity with numbers as to looking at the market as to where those trends are going to go. And so we did a little bit of math and we said, you know, if business owners, we got this 2.7 million, let's really start to break down those numbers to see what's a reasonable expectation for transactions. 1.3 million of those are going to exit in the next five years, so they claimed. 
So we break those numbers down to figure out there's, you know, about 56,000 people are expecting to sell a year over the next five years, right, if we just do, average that out. Biz by itself says we have 8,000 transactions a year right now in an upswing in our market, right? So what's that equate to? That equates to there's, there's seven times more businesses for sale than there's actually transactions that are, that are occurring. Now, biz by sell doesn't have the, the hold on the whole market, but, you know, so maybe that's five times or four times. Either way, there's a lot more inventory of expectations than there is actual buyers for the market. And some of that is really attributed to the demographics that we see. So these numbers aren't perfect, but we know that, you know, our baby boomer generation is one of the largest generations in the history of America, and they're getting to retire. So you know that you're in your mid-60s, maybe 70s, that generation. It's time to transition that business. Who's the next logical buyer? Well, it's the next generation, which is Gen X, which is my generation. There's about 44 million Gen Xers. Do a quick, you know, quick math uh, calculation on that one. You can see there's a supply demand available buyers and available sellers. We also know that the average age of a first-time entrepreneur is 43. That's set right in the heart of that, that Gen X requirement. So that's when these, when our generation is starting to look at buying. It's, it's got this uh, really big challenge for you because there's just a smaller generation of buyers, of prospective buyers out there. So that always brings us to the conversation of the next generation, those millennials, who you know are derided and uh, revered at the same time. Right? They're obviously a interesting generation because they're their size. They're larger than the baby boom generation. So good, we're going to get them to buy businesses. Some of the challenges we see with the millennials is they're real, generally risk averse. Despite the, the profile is that they're this very entrepreneurial generation, there are certainly pockets of that, but generally they look at investments from a short-term perspective, you know, which isn't surprising because they grew up in the Great Recession. You know? So same as the Great Depression era uh, generation, you, know, you hold on to your money. You make sure that it's, it's there and it's safe. Buying a business is a big risk. Starting a business is less risk because it's usually somebody else's money. And there's also the heavy emphasis on quality of life issues. It's hard to say, yeah, you're going to come in, you're going to work in this business 60, 70, 80 hours a week, you know, like most of you have in your business when they don't want to work those hours. You know, they have different things they want to balance. So it doesn't necessarily equate to be a, bit, a small business owner buying a company and being a millennial. So it would be interesting to watch how this shakes out over the next few years. It leads us now to talk about the different classes of buyer because buyers also, the types of buyers are going to influence your ability to sell and the prices you get and the structure of the deals that you have. And there are basically three types of buyers. There are strategic, right? that's your competitor or someone who wants to get into your market who's going to pay a premium right? because they like what you have. We also have our financial buyers, you know, those private equity groups, those investment groups that are looking at acquiring a business because of the investment return on it. And then there's the realities of the individual buyers. Those are people like us. You know, we're going to buy a business, we're going to work in it. We're buying a job for all intents and purposes. And so as an in intermediary, as someone who buys and sells businesses, I absolutely love strategic and financial buyers. Right? They, are, they are my favorite ones to deal with from the standpoint that they know what they want. They're contacting you because they have a very specific need. They're willing to pay more for the business because they have a definitive requirement for it. They know how they're going to make more money off of this. They structure deals better, you know, they're going to give you a stock deal maybe, they're going to give you an all-cash deal, maybe no seller financing. So more advantageous, better deals, and then they have the expertise to close a deal. So they're really great buyers if you're in a position where you can have a strategic buyer who's going to buy your company. And, you know, to the point that we like to talk about is they pay more, you know, which is a, is a, key, a key driver for everybody. We want to maximize our value, and a strategic and a financial buyer is going to do that. You can see what the multiples that they, they pay. They're good multiples. When you start talking about fours and fives and six multiples of cash flow, it's great. Versus, you know, here in our space, in the small mid size space, we're looking at multiples typically in the one to two, maybe up to a three times range. We don't get as much value as we want from that standpoint. And it can be frustrating for a business owner when you hear, yeah, your company's worth one times your earnings. You know, your total compensation. I can, I can get that just by working another year. You yes, you could, but you're still going to own the business. So. Those are the challenges of, of a small business dealing with an individual buyer. The multiples are, are lower. So in a perfect world, we're telling our clients, get as big as you can because you can maximize your value that way. And of course, that's a, that's a challenge. And 90% of our businesses in this country have employees under 20. These are typical small businesses, 90% of them. And only 4%, which is a statistic that amazes me, have revenues over a million dollars. 
You know, so if you have revenues over a million dollars, you're mm -hmm. part of a very small, small uh, piece. So those strategic and financial buyers will spend a lot of their time more so on that other 10%. We're dealing with the space with these individual buyers. You know? And when we talk about individual buyers, you know, they have some challenges that we want to talk about. And one of the things that we find out is that most people who start the journey to buy a business very rarely do. You know, nine out of 10 fail. Only one actually does it. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but for everyone who knocks on your door, who's an individual and says, I want to buy your business, you know, nine out of 10 of them aren't gonna be buyers for the business. They're never gonna buy a business. And that results in this, you know, statistic. And this is the, the, the bummer statistic, right? One out of five businesses that get listed for sale actually sells. You know, and there's a range of factors for that. You know, uh, Pepperdine uh, University does this whole capital market study, and they, they interview brokers like ourselves and buyers as to, well, why didn't that deal close? And you can see there's a range of things, everything from lack of capital, or the seller wasn't telling me the truth. You know, there's no market for the business, which is a frustrating one to hear. And then where we see a lot of the, these things come in play is the valuation gap, right? Our sellers and buyers disagree as to what the value of that business is. And then my favorite one is unreasonable demands. You know, and unreasonable is obviously a questionable term, but you know, what you think is unreasonable, I may think is completely reasonable. But it's a big, a big area where deals get, get built, uh, bogged down. And we're gonna go into a little bit more of those in a little bit later. So people ask, well, why, why don't they buy well? You know, why can't these individuals just come in and buy a business well? Uh, well? And the reality is because they've never bought a business before. It's a very unique transaction. It's not like buying a house. You buy a house, everything is clear. There's been an appraisal, we got an inspector comes in, it's pretty black and white. We know what the bank is gonna finance. Whereas the business, it's all about emotion. It's about what I, what I interpret when I see those numbers. You know, when I'm looking at what level of risk I'm willing to take. So when you do that, and if you don't have the experience or the expertise to buy a business, it can be overwhelming. So we see a lot of times that buyers, individual buyers will start down this path and it's a nightmare dealing with them because they're not educated on the process. They don't know what they're doing. And as a seller, that's gonna be incredibly frustrating because you might like this individual, you might like the offer, but they're gonna frustrate you because they don't know how to pull the trigger. They don't know how to get the deal done. Those can be very, very challenging things. So really four reasons why they don't know what they want. I can tell you I get calls all the time from individual buyers who say, I'm looking for a business. And I'll say, great, what do you want? <clears throat> well, something in manufacturing maybe, or a service business, no restaurants, maybe distribution. Um, yeah, maybe some technology. Okay. And you just give me a really wide universe. Uh, where do you want it to be? Well, it'd be nice if it was near me, but you know, it could be in Worcester, because I could drive all that far. And well, what size? Well, I'm not really sure. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, so they don't have a clear decision is what they want. They've just woke up someday and said, I want to buy a business, or they've been let go from a job and need a career change, but they haven't given any thought to it. So that's why most of them aren't successful. We also have the unrealistic expectations. So I have $50,000, but I need to make $150,000. So I need to buy a business with my $50,000 that's going to be able to support that. Fantastic. I wish I could find that too, because if it did, I would be buying it. Right? Those unexpectations, because they've, a lot of them come from jobs and they make a nice living and they don't, you know, and they don't have the risk to it. So they think, oh yeah, I can buy a business, have it pay its debt service, and still make my 100,000 plus a year. You know, very unrealistic uh, from a buyer standpoint. And they don't understand what they don't know. You know, they may have picked up a book or something or they're just winging it. So they're talking in a language that, you know, a lot of us can't relate to because it's not related to how a transaction works. And lastly, they just have bad business advisors. Right? They're not geared at this. They're not in business. So they don't know that they're supposed to have an attorney who understands how to buy a business. They don't understand they need an accountant who's not H&R Block you know, as they look at a deal. They don't understand that yeah, the, the branch manager at the bank isn't the person who's going to help them with their financing. They just don't know. So they don't have the right people around them to advise them. So fortunately, as a seller, though, there are certain things that you can do. Because you have the ability to control and influence two things, obviously yourself, and then your advisors, and we're gonna get into that in a few minutes, is the importance of building a really good, strong advisory team that's gonna help you because they can help you overcome the inexperience of a, of a buyer. And it's gonna be very, very important for you when, you when you're trying to sell. 
So let's now start to talk about how we're going to prepare for the sale. We've decided, yep, the market's right for us. I'm ready to, we're, we're ready to do this. We understand who our buyer's probably going to be, maybe what those value range might be. Let's now talk about how we prepare for it. And we can do, we do a whole seminar and, and topic just on the preparation side, the succession transition planning. But the first thing we always lead off with is, are you really ready to exit? You know, and we always tell our clients that exit means more than just saying, I'm tired of the business. You know, I'm tired of customers, I'm tired of employees. Give me a business that doesn't have any of those and I'm a happy guy. It's gotta be more than just the, the wind down and grind to say, I'm ready to get out. There's other things that you have to do as part of this process. And there's a range of them, right? There's, you wanna make sure the business is positioned correctly if you're ready to get out. Financial, we'll talk a little bit about that. Or do you know what you actually need from the sale of a business? Do you understand how you're gonna make money or live off your money after a sale, right? That business, whether it's the most profitable thing in the world or not, provides cash flow, right, for all of us. So knowing that how you're gonna survive without that cash flow, very, very important. Do you know what you're gonna do after you sell the business? What are those post ownership plans? Most business owners have no idea. Oh, I'm gonna golf, I'm gonna travel a little bit. That's great, but is that gonna be enough to keep you fulfilled and satisfied in, in going forward? You'll, you'll find statistics as the amount of depression it increases by like two thirds within three years after someone sells a business. Why? Because they don't know what to do with themselves. They work in the business 60, 70 hours a week. Now, what do I do? Having lunch with my, my spouse every day. It's not the same. Uh, mentally, are they ready? You know, can you really let go of the, the business and the, the cash flow and, the, and what that persona is, right? We're all, we're all wrapped up in who our business is. It's part of our identity. Can you let go of that? And then lastly, there's the family side. Are they ready for you to sell? You know, you may have kids in, in the business and they may not be happy about it. You may have kids who aren't in the business but are, you know, receiving compensation. Your spouse may not be ready for you to be home all the time. You know, so you got to make sure your family is, is aware of that. So like I said, there's a whole, whole seminar we can do on how to, how to plan and get yourself prepared for an exit. But, you know, like anything else, being prepared is very, very important if you're going to sell. So we're going to talk a little bit more so about this on a high level and then a little bit more detail about the business side of preparing because from our standpoint as selling the business, that's what we want to know is, is the business position to be sold. So there are three areas that we always do in the planning side, the personal side, what are you trying to achieve with this objective, you know, with this, what are your personal desires, what are you trying to get out of this? Wealth, again, have you talked to a financial planner, an advisor as to what you need? Most business owners I talk to have never done that. I ask about the retirement plan, they say, well, we've got a 401k. Okay, it needs to be a little bit more involved in that as you're planning for your, for your future. Um, and then there's the business review. Is it positioned to be sold? So there's a lot that goes into, into that. And again, there's lots of things that go into this personal review. You really have to prepare yourself for what you want out of a sale, like what you're gonna do with your life after the exit. Again, that wealth review, sitting down with that advisor, finding out, is there gonna be enough money to retire after I sell my business? Or am I gonna have to go work for somebody else? How am I gonna fill that gap if that gap is there? There's nothing worse, and I can tell you I've had the experience when I have a seller who tells me they're ready to go to market, we took them to market, we get the price we said we were gonna get, and they sit down with their accountant or lawyer after the, or advisor after the fact, and they say, Mike, we can't sell. We just did the numbers and it's not enough. You know, they went through that whole process, and you know, not only is it frustrating as we're this close to getting out, but that realization that it's not enough, that I need to more, I need to work more. You know, you get yourself wired to, to a sale at a particular time. So even before you engage with me uh, as, a, as a seller or in your planning process, talk to your wealth advisors. Find one if you don't have one to, to understand what you really need. And then there's that business <coughs> review. And this is the piece that, that we love to, to, to dig into because it's figuring out what's that business like? You know, and we have this single, this number one lesson. When you're gonna sell your business, you need to know more about your business than anyone else, than that buyer. Because that buyer, when they walk in the door, is gonna look for every negative thing they can find. It's the nature of the game. Because everything that I don't trust about that business, I'm either gonna walk away, or I'm gonna find a way to reduce your price. So, these surprises kill deals. You know, when things get popped up in due diligence, right? There's always, something. Oh, geez, maybe there was a customer concentration issue we found or, you know, we found out that this in particular employee is at risk or, you know, the, the compensation isn't really at market, so that's going to cost us more money. You know, know your business. 
know it inside and out. Know it better than what someone like me is going to come in and, and tear it apart about. What are they going to nitpick you with? And so when we're getting a business ready for sale, we have 18 areas that we assess, that we dig into looking at a business. Now, the larger the business, obviously the more complex, some of these may not rely, but these are all things that are going to impact and influence a buyer when they're looking at your company. You know, what industry is in it? What's going on in your industry? Do you have a lot of competition in your market? Who's your customer base? How's your technology? You know, I'm walking through your business and I see that the computer monitor looks really, really old. Hmm, that's going to cost me money. What else don't I know about that? You know, so those are the things that pop up during this due diligence process. You know, do you have your business processes document or is it all up in your head? I'm the owner, so it's all right there. You know, yeah, this is how we do things. Um, how are your employees? How's your pricing? We found we had one company that we just brought to market. What we found out is that not only did they have heavy customer concentration because one of the, the partner who died unexpectedly wanted to just get as much work in to be safe and secure, he was giving it away. So when he passed away and the other, the absentee owner came in and he looked at it and realized, well, we're not making any money on this customer and they now equate to about 75% of our business. We went from a valuation of like a million and a half on the business to $250,000, $300,000 because they weren't watching those types of things. So very, very important with your pricing and your, your customer concentration. All these things factor into what's going to influence your values and the attractiveness to a buyer. There's also understanding the value drivers and inhibitors of the business. Three things. When I get a call from a buyer, the three things they want to know. What industries do you have? They have very specific industries they want to be in. What's the size as far as the revenue and what's that cash flow? You know, that EBITDA, that seller's discretionary that we talked about. Those are going to influence the buyer's art. You know, I have some buyers who love manufacturing. I have others who can't stand it. I have others who want health care, others who don't want that. You know, so it all plays into who that buyer is going to be. And once you get through that first thicket with them, now they get into this next piece. What drives the desirability of that business? Do you have a reoccurring revenue stream? How are your gross profit margins and your net profit margins? Can this business scale? So if you're doing a million, can I get you to two million, three million, four million? And what's it going to take to do that? You know, the faster it can do that, the more attractive the opportunity. And then what do you have inside running the business? Most buyers are buying the management team. You know, do you have people that you rely on who are capable of executing or are going to stay with the business? You know, those drive value. And then we have the thing that we call the devil in the details. These are the things that all impact the value. We said, you know, that customer concentration or they're, I'm looking, walking through the shop and I see, you know, those machines look pretty old. What am I going to have to spend for investment? Well, there's a couple hundred thousand dollars. We're going to take that off the purchase price. You know, so those types of things are the ones that impact you. So lesson number two, number one way to improve the value of your business is to position so as consistent growth and profitability without your involvement. If you can have a business that's running without you, I can sell it for a lot more money. I can find more buyers for it. So how do we get started now in this process? We've done our preparation. We think we're ready to sell. What's next? And there are really three things we have to do. The first one is decide how you're going to market. Is this something you're going to do yourself? Are you going to hire an intermediary or business broker? Step two is build that team. Build your team of advisors who are going to help guide you through this process. And the third piece is whatever we come up with, execute and execute it well. Right? The best plans, if they're not executed well, fail. So you know, a, good, a good team is going to put together a good, a good plan for you and hopefully a good execution. But if you can't execute on it, you're not going to have a successful sale. So this leads us to the first, first piece. And I always, you know, like this quote, he who represents himself has a fool for a client. And this comes down to whether or not I should hire an intermediary business broker to represent me or I should try to sell the business on my own. I can tell you that I know people, my, my father as an example had a, does this for a living like I do, had a successful business that they were going to sell. You know what he did? He went and hired another intermediary. Because the reason he did that is because he's, he knows that there's an emotional side to this there's a, that, that gets in the way, right? You're better off having someone else who, who's representing you who's not close to the deal, right? We can be, um, you know, practical about it. We can give you an unbiased and un, unvarnished opinion as to what we see. Whereas if it's yours and you're selling it, it's really hard to separate my ownership from my role in trying to sell the business. So if you're gonna go that route and hire a professional, you know, here's what you need to know. There are really two types of, of intermediaries out there. There's the, 
classic business broker who handles a lot of small businesses, you know, the, a lot of the Main Street type of stuff. You know, they don't typically charge a retainer fee, you know, and they usually have a success fee in the 10 to 12 percent range of the sale price. So you sell for, you know, a million dollars, they're going to take a hundred, hundred and twenty thousand dollars on that on that piece. We say a more of a shotgun approach to marketing, which what we mean by that is that they're, you know, they're using the biz buy sell sites. They're going out here. They're kind of wide open look to see who might come in as a buyer because they're looking for an individual. So they're looking for that needle in the haystack. And they're probably not as involved in the transaction once we've agreed to the terms. All right, there's a letter of intent. Great, I'm all done. Let me know when the closing is. I'll get my check. Conversely, there's more the traditional M&A intermediary, you know, who typically handle more larger size businesses, sophisticated businesses. They typically require a retainer. You know, some of these are monthly retainers and get very expensive. And those retainer fees are credited back against your success fee when you pay them. Conversely, though, the success fee is much lower. Yes? How do you position Van Group in, in this choice here? We are a hybrid. So the, the beauty of being in Western Mass is you get to see a little bit of everything. So um, we have a, you know, we do handle business brokerage side and then we also handle large deals. So I mean, the largest transaction we handled was a $50 million deal, the smallest one was a 30,000. You know, so <laughs> it's, um, it ranges and you know, what we do for fees is sometimes if we think it's on the, on the larger side, there's a retainer. With our smaller business brokerage stuff, we don't require retainers. We keep our same fee structure though. So, and we work on, you know, the, what's known as a Lehman formula. So it's six percent on the first million, five percent on the second million, four percent on the third million. So it, it scales down, um, and then there's minimum fees that are that are paid. So, um, your M&A intermediary again, you know, is really got more of a strategic approach to finding buyers. So that means we're doing a lot of targeting and profiling as to who might we think this buyer is going to be, who we're going to target out to. We may not use a biz buy sell or some of those types of things to get the company out because we don't want people to know. A lot of times if you're looking for these types of size companies, you're never going to find them on a listing site. You can go to my website, you're not going to find my business listings out there. If you go to biz buy sell, you can find my small business listings, but you'll never find my you know, larger deals out there. We just don't advertise and market them that way. They're not being sold that way. And then when you're in this role, you're, this person is holding your hand throughout the process. They're, they're with you during the due diligence stage and they're continuing the negotiations. They may be drafting the letter of intent. They're with you, maybe even be at the closing if they actually have a close, you know, the, the final closing ceremony. So very, very engaged in the process. You know, their job is to make sure nothing goes wrong. They're managing your team. So comes to the question, well, how do you find one of these people? You know, and how do you hire one and know that you've got a good one? You know, we always say the best way to find one is to talk to people you trust people who have sold their business, bankers, lawyers, you know, accountants that you know who are in the, the transactional world. Hey, who do you know that's really good at this? I tell you, 80, 90% of our business comes from referrals, you know, not from our direct marketing. It's because other advisors we've worked with trust us to do a good job with a deal. You know, so that, that means a lot if it's coming in from a referral standpoint. There's things that you need to know as you're interviewing an intermediary. You, know, you need to understand their process and approach for how they go through a, uh, through a transaction, you know, very important. Certifications, you know, I'm kind of a big believer that all a certification means is that you know how to pass a test. There's lots of, lots of intermediaries out there who have their license, you know, the, uh, on the CMAA or something like that. Really this means they found an organization that they can take a test and now said they're certified. It doesn't mean anything. Find out what their track record is, right? How many deals have they closed? What types of deals have they closed? Those are the types of things, right? It's real world experience that you're looking for. You're not looking for, for designations. Talk to them about your expectations. This is what I expect from the sale prices. I expect how I to be communicated with. Whatever those range of things with those, those service expectations are for them, so they're aware of that. I have some clients who, hey, just let me know when, they're, when we've got someone who's really hot. I've got other ones who are calling me every week. Is there anything new? Anything new for activity? So understand and lay out what your expectations are for that and it, it solves a lot of problems. The last thing and the most important thing is make sure you're comfortable with this person. When you hire an intermediary, I can tell you, you become best friends for a, for a stretch of time, right? They're calling, you know, as my wife can attest, people call me at all hours of the night when we're working on a deal. And you gotta be really, really comfortable with them because you're making a very big decision. You know, the sad part for us is once a deal's done, I never hear from them again, but you know, it's, it's the nature of it. But get comfortable with them. Make sure that you have a personality that's gonna to equate to them, you know, that you can work with. 
The next piece is to build that team. And there's a variety of individuals on that team. There's your accountants, your bankers, and your intermediate, and your business advisors, and your family members, and financial advisors, your lawyers. And you notice I've got two bolded here, accountants and lawyers. Very, very critical that you have the right accountant and lawyer as part of your team. Because they are, particularly a lawyer, really, really engaged in the, the nuances of the transaction. And again, I always say, professional initials don't mean to act. Right? Just because someone is an attorney doesn't mean they know how to close a commercial transaction. Just someone, because someone is an accountant can handle mm -hmm. file a tax return doesn't mean they know how to structure a deal from a tax perspective to maximize your value. Right? Doing deals has a whole different uh, approach to it. You know, there's this argument, is it an art or a science? Well, selling a business, you know, there's a science to it. There's a process to it. Right? We can have all our checkpoints but there is an art that's part of this process. And to know the art, you've got to be really into it. You've got to be doing it all the time. You've got to be practicing it. Because transactions have a lot of gray area. There's a lot of things that happen that, you know, you have to come up on the fly with. So you have to have the experience to know how to adapt and react. I can tell you what happens when you have a bad advisor. They kill deals. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a great example of a deal that we had when our, one of our advisors, our clients, hired an estate attorney to do the deal. Trust them, you know, they did some other work for us. They're, they're like family, we love them. We're gonna use them for the deal. Okay, so we got into the process and the buyer and the seller, we negotiated the, the letter of intent, which is a non-binding agreement, lays out all the basic terms of the document, of, of the deal. Our party signed it, sent it to the lawyers to start the paperwork. Well, this attorney threw an absolute fit. I don't wanna go to the documents. There's some things with the LOI that, you know, I don't like, you know. I said, well, fine, negotiate them during the purchase and sale agreement. We've already gotten past the letter of intent. And the screaming response I got was, that's not how I do things. Well, that's how the buyer and the seller want to do things. They've already agreed to the terms. Now get into here because no one wants to spend money on legal counsel who are coming in and making the changes to a letter of intent that's non-binding, that doesn't have any you know, relative value to the terms of the transaction. What ended up happening to this deal in very short order is the buyer walked away. As he made it very clear, I'm not engaging in a situation where you're gonna have an attorney on the other side who's gonna drive up my cost. And he walked. You know, so that advisor, you know, directly and indirectly, there were obviously some other things involved, but was a big reason why that deal was lost. So having a bad advisor team does some things that we don't like. It certainly costs money that can get very, very expensive when you've got attorneys who are bickering back and forth. They create stress, right, because they don't necessarily know what they're doing or they're posturing or they're doing the wrong thing, so they're making the deal harder than it needs to be. They can make you look bad, right? Don't you have a good advisor? Can't you get in control of your attorney on this situation? And, you know, most importantly, they kill deals. No one can kill a deal better than a bad attorney because they're controlling the process once you get past the letter of intent, when they're drafting documents. You know, so it's, it's really good to have a good uh, advisory team. And so when you start to look for them, how do you choose that advisor? Ask for references. Have they done deals like this? Understand the track record. You know, talk to those people that you trust. Make sure they're open-minded. That's very, very important in this process. If you've got someone who is, under, is open to looking at things. The, the thing that always worries me is when you talk to an attorney or accountant and say, well, we're looking at a stock deal. And they'll say, absolutely not. Stock deal is bad. You could have potential, you know, liabilities there that you don't know about. Yeah, but I can actually buy the company for less, <coughs> and the buyer can, you know, get a capital gains rate. We can do some other things. If they're not open-minded on those types of things, they're going to cost you money because they're not looking at the overall scope of things. Make sure they're reasonable, right? No one likes to have to deal with attorneys and accountants and advisors who have egos, who are making the deal about themselves. So make sure you've got someone who's reasonable, practical, and knows what the objective is, which is get the deal done, get it closed. Don't nitpick over things that don't really matter in the big picture of things. Lastly, make sure, again, you're comfortable with them, you know, that you have a good working relationship with them, that you can trust their advice, that you can um, feel good about working with them. So that brings us to our number three lesson as part of this process is ideally hire an attorney who only practices business law, someone who lives and breathes in the business world. You know, and also, if you can, make sure they have extensive experience with transactions like yours. Great story, we did a deal with a private equity company a couple 
years ago. And they brought in their, their law firm, which is Jones and Day, who's a massive, you know, attorney, you know, law firm that's got, you know, seven hundred fifty dollar, thousand dollar an hour lawyers. My client was absolutely convinced he should use his, you know, local attorney who has, you know, herself, you know, no no backup, no anything has never done a deal like this. You know, it didn't work out well as well for my client. Did he get his sale? Yes. Did he get his money? Yes. But if anything ever goes wrong after the fact, he's not in a good, uh, good spot because he didn't have an attorney who knew the nuances and ins and outs of the stock deal, of dealing with that type of firm. Didn't have the, uh, the ability to push back, right? All those things that you're looking for because they're not familiar with this deal. They were out of their, out of their element, out of their league. Um, so find someone who's got good experience in doing transactions similar size, similar nature. Next piece is execute the plan. So you've engaged someone like ourselves, what's it look like? There are different steps in the, in the process and you know, this is our process. I'm gonna assume that for 90% of my colleagues in the industry, it's pretty similar to this. The first thing we do once we get engaged, we put a value on the company. From there, we start to build our what's known as a transaction strategy. And we're gonna go into each one of these in a little bit more detail, but transaction strategy is well, how are we pricing the company? Who are we targeting for our buyers and how exactly are we communicating with them? The offering memorandum. This is a document that gets put together that explains the who, what, when, when, why, where, how, isn't this the greatest company in the world document that goes to a buyer once they've executed a confidentiality agreement. Right? It communicates those information about the company that we want them to know. It's how we position it. This is why this is such a great opportunity, Mr. Buyer, why you should buy this company. Here's the things you know and things that maybe we don't want you to know that we're going to you know, not highlight or illustrate and hope you don't find. Then they go into the offer process. So how do we get an offer going? You know, that letter of intent, the negotiation, then the deal management side of it, right? Once we get to the letter of intent executed and then we've got the attorneys involved and the accountants involved, the banks involved, how do we make sure that everyone is doing their job? Because everyone's moving the deal, deal forward, right? There's nothing worse than deal fatigue when a deal drags. We have one that we were engaged. It's uh, an internal sale between a buyer and seller. Our job was just to structure the deal and then you know, turn it over to the attorneys to get it done. We had all that done and agreed to last September. Today's what, May 18th, 19th? Still not closed. Right? Deal fatigue. The attorneys nitpicking, doing this and that. No good reason or bad reason for it. It's just happened. So where do you think the frustration level is with the parties? Where do you think the legal bills are? Having someone who's going to move that piece through is very important, and then obviously we want to get to a close, which is where you get a check and we get a check, and everybody's happy. So we're going to talk a little bit about value, and there are, you know, a range of spectrums on on value. And I know you had a conversation, you know, we had someone in talk about valuations and, and how those work, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about from what we see from a market standpoint. And so, you know, appraisers often talk about fair market value. Right, which is an IRS standard of <coughs> hypothetical buyers, hypothetical sellers. And when we talk in our world, we deal really two more different types of values. We talk about market value, which is that, that fair value, which is that hypothetical buyer and seller, but also taking the current condition of the market. What's going on in the reality of this? Is it actually gonna sell? And then we also talk strategic and investment value. Right? This is what our um, strategic buyers or our financial buyers pay. This is the over and above. So if we're really lucky, we're getting a premium. The market says it's worth X, but you know GE just came in to look at us, so now it's worth Y. And what are those premiums? And they typically run in that zero to 25, 30% range if you can get them. This is really healthy, nice strategic premiums. If you can find them. So we talked a little bit about this already, but these are the two terms that you need to know when you're talking value. One is that EBITDA, right? Because this is the, the multiple that our strategic and financial buyers are talking about. They value based on a multiple of EBITDA. Uh, that's, a, that's a five times EBITDA, that's a three times EBITDA. If we're lucky that's an eight times EBITDA. Our seller's discretionary earnings is our EBITDA plus what do we make? That fair market compensation of what we make. And then a strategic, you know, an individual buyer is typically looking at that number. And they're gonna say, all right, well if the multiple is two on this, I gotta pay myself X, what do I have left? Our, our financial buyers typically aren't doing that, our strategic buyers, they're not worried about paying checks off that they're looking at that raw number. It's assumed that someone's working it. So 
those are the two numbers that we deal with when we talk about valuation with our companies. And, you know, EBITDA is worth more than seller's discretionary earnings. Simple, simple fact. So, great example, we've got a company that's got $450,000 in seller's discretionary earnings, $400,000 in EBITDA. Great. That buyer, that EBITDA buyer is going to pay four times that, that EBITDA. That seller's discretionary earnings buyer is going to pay two times, you know. So even though there's more seller's discretionary earnings, the multiples get driven by those EBITDA buyers. And when we talk about market realities of those numbers, this is a, a, an example. So we have this access to a database called the Institute of Business Appraisers, and they have 40 or 50,000 transactions that get submitted by intermediaries of companies that sold. You know, and it's all the details as to, well, this is the revenue, this was the discretionary earnings, this was, you know, the sale price. Great. 125 restaurants in there, all with $60,000 in seller discretionary earnings. These are the sale prices. So if you're looking at that, one of them sold for $40,000, one for almost $400,000. Why? They're the same, conceptually from a valuation standpoint, that discretionary earnings is the same. It's $60,000. So what drives that? If value, you know, if we know that market data and the cash flow for, for a restaurant is two times the seller's discretionary earnings. Why aren't these all selling for $120,000, $130,000, something in there? It's because that fair value component, that what that buyer is looking at. You know, I walk into that restaurant and I see it's really nice and clean, the equipment is in great shape, you know, the servers are friendly, you know, the revenue looks great, versus that restaurant that I walk into and it looks tired and dirty. Those are things that are driving the, those, those multiples. Um, you know, so fair value is really, really important. And just because we have an EBITDA X or a seller discretion earnings of Y doesn't mean we're going to get those multiples that the market data indicates. So we look at those nuances. Of, and this is a great example of a situation that, that we have. A company that, that came, they had an appraisal. Fair market value identified you know, $250,000 as to the value. Because the cash flow says X, you know, we can get to there. However, when we have our, our buyer's hat, we're marketing it, we're saying, there's almost no value here. Well, why, how can that be? Well, it's a small company, it uh, has no fixed assets, and all the knowledge is in, there's you know, two or three employees, is the owner, it's all his relationships. Who's gonna pay for that? Nobody, right? Or if they're gonna pay for it, it's gonna be you know, over time on a retention basis and different things, but I don't know what that looks like. So. The reality is from a sales standpoint, it's unlikely I'm going to be able to sell that company, much less sell it for the fair market value. So it's always good to understand the market realities of trying to sell a company. It's like me sometimes trying to sell my company. I have great years, I have bad years. No one's going to pay for my company just because it's all about me. Next piece is, you know, you build your transaction strategy. So the transaction strategy is really a simple document. Your, your intermediary, again, is going to look and say, all right, these are the issues you need to address before a sale. Or at least be aware that this is what's going to pop up. So be prepared for a buyer to, to mention X, Y, and Z. Here's how we think it's going to impact your price or the structure of your deal. Our approach to pricing, which we'll get to in a second, you know, who are the likely buyers that we see? Who do we want to target? What's that profile that we've got based on looking at your business? So the transaction plan lays all those things out. And it looks at what are those potential deal killers, you know, those weaknesses that, that we see. So that always brings us to the question, well, how do we price the business? We know it's worth X, or we think it's worth this. So what should we do? Should we put it on, with a, on the market with a purchase price? Should we put it on higher than what we think it is because we know someone wants to negotiate? Do we not put a price on at all? And so we have some rules of thumb that we use when we, when we contemplate that. We establish a purchase price if we're you know, a smaller company. We have unsophisticated buyers. If I tell them, well, just make an offer, who knows what I'm going to get? So if I can provide some guidance on that. We establish one if we have a clear indication what we think the, the sale price is and if you're comfortable with that. I have a great example, I have a company we brought to market and I said, look at the value is gonna be between 150 and two, you're probably gonna get an offer in the 165 to 175 range. But we'll put it on the market two and a quarter gives us a little bit of room. What do you think the offer came in? 175. My client though wasn't happy because he now didn't, he really wanted the 225. So you gotta be comfortable with the price if you're gonna put it on and say, yeah, this is what we're gonna get. We try not, to, we tr usually leave a little bit of room in for negotiating, but we really like to go to the market with a number that says, this is where we want. So I didn't put it on at 200,000 because I'm expecting 150. I put it on at 200,000 
because I expect the offer is going to be somewhere in that 175 to 2 range. We're pretty firm on that. So, you know, we don't leave a lot of space on that. You know, if performance has been consistent, you know, and there's really moderate fluctuations, it's a good time to value because it's, it's pretty transparent and straightforward as to what we have for, for numbers. Easy to put a, put a value on it. Conversely, we don't put a number on it if the buyer is more likely to be a strategic or financial buyer. Because when I, set a, when I set a price sometimes, what have I done? I've set a ceiling. Very rarely do I have someone who comes in and says, I know that's 200000 Let me pay you 225 or 250 So when I, when I set that price, I don't want to do it with someone who I think has the ability to pay more. I want them to tell me what the price range is. They may ask me, well, where do you think you're going to be? And I might say, well, well, you know, it might be in a multiple between four and five or something like that, depending on things. Okay. You know, so it gives us a range, which is important. If you're open to a range, I don't have my heart set on a number, but I'd really like to be between, you know, half a million and a million dollars on this, on this person. Okay. So if I get you 650, you're happy. If I get you 800, you're happy. Yep. Equally happy. Okay. Good. Well, let's see where the market brings us to. And then, you know, if we have these swings in performance. Maybe we had a really bad year last year, but this year's looking good. Well, let's discount last year. Let's pre pretend it didn't happen and hope the buyer takes the same approach. So let's not put a number on it. So those are some of the strategies we use when we talk about pricing. Targeting buyers, again, it's all about profiling. You know, and I know it sounds like a little bit of a stalker thing, but we, you know, we look and identify what are those characteristics we're looking for in our buyers. Oh, they're going to have, you know, maybe they're in this type of industry and they have this particular niche and skill set, which would make them a great buyer because we'd fit in really nice with them or, you know, we need someone who's got certain types of money or background and experience. Okay, let's profile them. Where do we start to find those? Well, we do a lot of research and more research and more research. And, you know, once you have that, then you build out a database of who your prospective buyers are. And then you start to build marketing materials, you know, that offering memorandum and maybe a blind executive summary or something that's going to speak to them. What are the, what are the hot tops going to get them to open this up and go, Yes, we want to call this company. This looks like it'd be a great fit for us. Right? So there's that marketing piece that comes into putting your business on, on the market. You know, it's selling it. You know, as to why they should buy it. The outreach side of this, you know, there's strategy to that. Is there's two ways. We've got obviously our specific marketing materials. When we're dealing with a business that we're going to shotgun, you know, we might go. We've got our database of referral sources. You know, every broker has people they go to. We know our database is probably four or five hundred that we constantly target of lawyers, accountants, bankers, financial advisors, people who know people who look to buy businesses. You know, they have existing clients. We also have a buyer database that we go out to and I can say, all right, we've got a manufacturer. Who in our database might be interested in this? We market that way. We go to websites like BizBuySell and BizQuest and those types of things and post out there because, you know, we're looking for the needle in the haystack. We're looking for that match. So maybe someone is going to pop up with it. And then we also may use, depending on the size, deal platforms like Axial and Bankers Bay and Deal um, DealStream, which are geared more towards those strategic and financial buyers that, that we want to be able to find that maybe we didn't know about. Then we have our target approach, you know, that database that we've made of particular buyers, you know, that, that's how we're going to market to them. A lot of times we use, I, and you'll be happy, to, direct mail. <laughs> you know, we find that people open mail. They don't open email, but they open up mail. So. You know, we'll send our letters that way um, and follow up phone calls to, to get to the buyers. So there's a, there's a real strategy to how you reach out to potential um, buyers. The next piece is that offering memorandum. So once somebody says, yes, we're interested, here's your confidentiality argument back. Great. Here's the book you get. This tells you so what you need to know about the company. Sometimes before we even let them get to that piece, we give them just a a high level snapshot that's, that's even more condensed and say, before we let you know even more, you're going to tell us how you might structure a, a value of the company, how you're going to maybe structure this deal, what your indications are, what you might do with management, what the, all these types of things. So we try to pre-qualify them even further before we let them get too deep into the process. So we let them, you know, we make them jump through a couple hoops. So we've got our buyer. They've looked at the offering memorandum. They love the company. We've talked to them. Now they're ready to buy. They're ready to make the offer. What happens, right? From offer to close, we call it. And there are a range of things that happen in this stage, right? This is where we negotiate all those little details. Well, no, we want we want this for a price, or you know what? You're going to include that company car for my guy if he's sticking around as an employee, or whatever those types of things. No, the seller financing is not going to is not going to finance that much financing. So we negotiate all those things. We have the numbers, 
right? So we're playing with the numbers on, on both sides. We have the tax side. This is where that accountant becomes really, really important. How do we structure this deal with those allocations that I'm going to maximize what I get at the end of the day? Because that's what matters, right? Um, what's the analysis that's got to go into this, right? So we get an offer in. This is great. It's this five-page letter of intent. Well, what's it saying there? What are those nuances and those details that we really need to know about? Okay. What's the strategy we're going to use as we, as we go forward with this? Um, what's the process? I'm going to lay out the process. Here's how due diligence is going to work. Here's when you can speak to my customers. Here's when you can't speak to my customers. Here's when you can <coughs> let my employees know. You know, there's a process that we have to agree to in this. Then there's the legal side and, you know, legal documents and all the reps and warranties and those deal terms. And then there's the people side of it, right? So all these things come into factor during the closing stage. And there's really four key components to a deal. Um, there's the emotion side, there's the knowledge side, there's the strategy and the tactics. So when we talk emotion, as a seller, this is an incredibly emotional process for you, right? And I always love this quote, and it's, this is the real quote from The Godfather. You know, in the movie it says, it's not personal, it's just business. It's wrong quote. In the book, it's actually this quote. It's, of course it's personal, it's your business. All business is personal, right? This is your business. You've probably started it. You've spent more time with your business than you probably have your family over the years. You know, you've led it. You've given everything you have to it. So now someone's going to come in and buy it. You're going to give it up. And what that buyer's coming in and he's telling you all these things that are wrong with your business, right, once he's gotten into this process. So it's incredibly emotional. And we always say that you can go, you know, 60 seconds or left from those incredible highs to those incredible lows on the, on the business side. We had a bad conversation, you know, the attorney called us and said, well, they want this. Horrible, we just had a meeting with the, with the buyer, things were great. So it's a constant up and down as to how that transaction flows, which is why it calls at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. Right? Someone had a couple glasses of wine, was thinking about things, and Mike, can you talk me off the roof, there's something I don't like, or, you know, about this, right? So that's, that's what happens. That's the emotional side of a transaction. And you need to be able to control your emotion because if I can't control my emotion, what happens? I lose a deal or I do something stupid that costs me money. Um, of course, emotion then talks about ego. And ego is the biggest deal killer there is, right? Because ego, ego feeds us. It's what makes us entrepreneurs in the first place while we start a business. It's the risk side of it. We're better than everybody. We can do this. And you're coming in and you're telling me I'm doing this wrong with my business or you're only going to offer me this? Screw you, right? This is my business. You're not going to tell me this or that. So, you know, are you going to negotiate this? I'm not doing that. I'm not sticking around for that long. Whatever it may be, there's an ego side to this that is incredibly important to control. And conversely, that ego also relates to your advisors, right? You have to be able to control the egos of your advisors. Sometimes... You know, and I wouldn't name any names, but there are certainly lawyers and accountants and advisors who, you know, they live for this stuff. This is their adrenaline flow. And so, you know, they're going to they're gonna be the hero on something. You know, rather than being practical, they may come in and, no, this is the deal term. It's, it's not important. You know, so you have to control their, try to control their egos as well because it costs you money. Um, the knowledge thing. Knowing is half the battle, right, the G.I. Joe uh, mindset. And so what are those things that you need to know? You don't need to know all the ins and outs of a transaction as far as, um, well, what does this rep and warranty mean? That's why you have a lawyer as an accountant for it. But here's the realities that you need to know going into a deal. You need to know the different perspectives between a buyer and a seller. So the seller's perspective, the business is unique. This is my baby, right? I built this. This is something special. It's unique. Therefore, it's worth a lot more money than, than what this guy with a spreadsheet is telling me it's worth. I had a client who I, I gave him the <coughs> offer, and I said, this is right where it is. He said, yeah, but you know what? I just invested in new menu boards and a new point of sale system. Where's that on the price? I said, well, it's not. It's there because you had to do that. They would have, they would have knocked your price down if you weren't doing those things. But yeah, but this is business is unique. It's, it's special, and I've made these investments. It doesn't matter. So that inflated sense of value happens frequently with our sellers. They want all cash. Love cash deals. It's nice. We gloss over the flaws. Yeah, don't worry about those things. Those, you know, I just haven't had the time to get to that about the business, or it's not a big deal. And then they want to be paid for the opportunity. Nice young guy like you take over this business. World's your oyster. What can you not do with this business? That's why you should pay me X. 
Conversely, we have our buyer, our negative guy, right? They don't care about the history. They don't care that the business was founded in 1932 by your great grandfather and you know, he did X, Y, and Z and what it used to do in revenue 15 years ago. He's interested in what it's doing right now and where he can take it or she can take it. Fair market value doesn't apply. So you can bring me your appraisals and you can tell me it's worth X. I'm telling you, to me, it's worth that. Okay, that's the reality. I want you to finance the deal or part of it or most of it, right? Because I don't have the money to do all this or you know, the bank may want you to, to finance it. So we want, we want the seller to be involved in the financing. Yeah, but I want all cash. I don't. I don't want any more risk. I didn't like the risk of owning the business when I owned it. Now I'm going to take the risk on you and lend you money. No. They overanalyze. They did pick on the on the most ridiculous things sometimes when they when they get into things that aren't really important, but they don't know. And the opportunity is theirs. They're not paying for it. They know there's an opportunity here. That's why they're buying the business. But they're the ones who got to make the investment and the sweat equity into it. So they're not paying you for that. If you wanted that value, you should have done it. The Ten Commandments of a Small Business Transaction. Other area you need to know. What's good for the buyer is not good for the seller and vice versa. Stock deal versus an asset deal. Well, great for the stock deal is great for the seller. Capital gains treatment. Bad for the buyer. I don't get to take any write-up on it, on the depreciation. Okay? All these things happen constantly. Seller financing. Great for the, great for the buyer. Bad for the seller. So there's always this yin and yang to, to transactions that we have to find a balance to. The buyer probably doesn't have enough money to do the deal. They, do, they just don't. The company's worth half a million dollars. It means they need someone who's probably got $200,000 in to be able to do the deal. Eh, they may not have it. You know? So it makes it, makes it hard. That means you're going to participate in the, in the financing whether you want it to or not. Hence number three. Seller financing is going to be part of the deal. Most buyers expect it. And that percentage that we're seeing increases every year more and more. And part of that chance is because we don't have asset intensive businesses anymore. Great example, we had a company, uh, an asbestos company, was doing a million and five every year. Owners made half a million dollars every year, barely worked in the business. So we had a buyer, we got a good offer. The reality was <coughs> the financing, I balance sheet had $7,000 in fixed assets on it. So I go to the bank, what am I financing on that purchase price? Well, nothing, goodwill. The banks don't finance goodwill. I can't, I can't, I can't sell it if it doesn't, doesn't work out. So that's why you see a lot more seller financing today. We have these, we have these transactions and service related companies that aren't asset intensive. Good advisors know how to close deals and are critical success as we've talked about. Number five, the sale price doesn't matter. It's what you net out. So many buyers or sellers have this concept that, well, if I just get a million dollars for the business, or two million dollars, I need that price. <coughs> okay, but the structure, you're gonna, you can maybe take less and get more money. I don't care. I, mentally, I need to need to sell for that. So it's very hard sometimes when people have numbers in their mind. It happens all the time. Numbers don't lie. There's only so much we can do from a financing standpoint when, when you're talking about a deal. It's just the reality. Numbers are there. Banks are not investors. They don't take risk. So they're looking to mitigate as much risk as possible, which means a lot of seller financing, which means what can they get it valued for? What can they get it praised for on the realist? All these different pieces. No such thing as a win-win deal. I know as much as everyone loves to think it's a win-win, in our world, a good deal is when everyone's a little bit unhappy. That's a good standpoint, because if everyone thinks they won, eh, it means someone lost. And then, you know, be wicked smart. Keep everything in perspective. So those are the nine. And then the last one, you're selling because you want to cash out. We always have sellers who come and talk to us about legacy and this and those, all these things that they want, you know, for the business. Oh, I want my employees to be taken care of, my customers. But when it comes down to, yeah, I have someone who's perfect who's going to do those, but they're going to offer you $50,000 less. Well, no, I'm not taking that. Right? It's the money. Right? I'm selling because I need to take that illiquid asset and turn it into liquidity. You know? So in most cases, not all the time, it's about cashing out. It's about maximizing that value. It's not about those other things. So a, buyer, you know, a seller can talk to you. You guys can talk. Blue in the face about all these things. Unless you're going to put your money where your mouth is, it's, it's secondary. So... If you understand that, and our buyers understand that, we're in good shape. Last piece we get into is the strategic decisions. What are you getting? How is it being structured? How is it financing? And this is when your advisors really come into, into play here. When we talk about purchase price in small businesses, what is it equal to? It's, well, what does my buyer have for money he can put in? What do we think we can get financed? How much are you willing to put into it? You know, what's your commitment with some creative solutions that we can do? That's what we get to a number. 
So if I get my strategic or financial buyer, it's all cash, here you go. With us, when we're dealing with companies like us, it's a lot more creative. Well, maybe I'm going to get an employment agreement for a while to take part of the money, or you know, maybe we're going to increase the, the rent on the building that they're, they're going to lease as a way to get this done. So how do we always find these balance? What are those creative solutions that we can do? And that ties into lesson number five, this concept of something called an earnout. We're seeing a more and more in transactions because it's a way for us to bridge the gap between what a buyer wants to pay and what a seller wants for the transaction. So what it does is it typically tied to something like sales. So I'm going to get a percentage of sales over X dollar or up to X amount for a period of time. So great, you, the business continues to perform, Mr. Seller, you're going to get your money. The buyer knows that if it doesn't, well then he's not, you know, he's not going to have to pay that. So we find them to be very, very valuable in bridging those gaps in, in the valuation particularly when it comes to retention of business and clients. On the tactic side, there's always the stock versus the asset side. When we're dealing with smaller businesses, we're typically dealing with asset sales, which means a lot of this is an ordinary income you know, that we get, so we're getting higher tax rates, but we typically walk away with our cash and our receivables, pay off our debts. With a stock deal, great news, it's capital gains, um, you know, but we're not maybe walking away with our receivables, we're leaving a working capital in there. so. There's always a, a, a give and take with them, but typically, you know, stock deal is great for our sellers, and uh, an asset deal is great for our buyers because of the depreciation standpoint. When we get to larger deals, there's ways to to mitigate that. You know, uh, the different IRS things that you can do. And lastly, we're wrapping up here. Tactics. These are all the things that, you know, are going to factor into the transaction. This is again a could be its whole presentation itself into when you start to get into, well, how do we get financing? You know, what's that financing plan look like? And then what are the legal documents? What's in each one of those? And the, uh, the reps and warranties. So what am I committing myself to and, and swearing an oath of, you know, as to uh, after the fact? And then what am I indemnifying against? And, the, you know, all these devils in the deal to, in the deals that you have to, that to deal with. And again, lawyers and accountants can get you up here and probably speak for hours on each one of these the ins and outs of reps and warranties and demarcations and you know, the benefits of this particular structure or, or not. Good morning. I'm Mark Abramson. I work for mm -hmm. Cone Company Real Estate in Greenfield. I've been there for about five years. I've worked in real estate for 37 years in Franklin County, Greenfield, Burniston. Some of the things I will tell you will support a lot of the things that Mike had told you earlier. But some of the things may be in conflict, and I think it's because we live in Franklin County. Franklin County is a unique community um, in that we're small scale. There's very little large scale type businesses. In this room, how many people are less than 20 employees? How many people are less than 10 employees? How many people are less than five employees? All right, so that's what I'm gearing my presentation to. Um, and one of the first things that I, uh, I'll discuss a little bit is, is my qualifications. Uh, and I do agree with what Mike said about certifications and abbreviations next to your name. A lot of them are meaningless. Uh, my designation, it's the CCIM as a Certified Commercial Investment Member. I received that in 1981. It took me five years to get it. And before I could get it, I had to demonstrate through transactions um, and involvement in different types of the business uh, in order to get that type of a, a designation. Um, but I will be honest with you, it, tra it trained me to do more of investments not businesses. So I can analyze cash flows from a multifamily, from an office building, from an industrial building, and that's what my training was at the end of that five-year plan. What I've done since then is I've taken seminars. I learned a lot from what Mike had, had said this morning and kind of geared that to my work in Franklin County. <coughs> And I still put it down to cash flows. And a lot of the things that Mike had said earlier, cash flows are important. 
and I treat them a little bit differently. And I always frowned upon determining values by a set formula because I do believe that Franklin County is unique. And so what I did is, is a real life approach. And you'll see that as I pass it around when I get to that stage of what I call the annual property operating data sheet, which is what the CCIM trained me to do to analyze that. And I have adapted it to be a business opportunity APOD so that it then analyzes what you're producing, what the bottom line would be for a buyer coming in and taking that over and running it. So there's some discussions that you need to have as to the type of person, if you want to bring it to market, that you'd like to list it with. Um, Mike's company, Van Group, is a advisor, broker, and as he said, a hybrid that gets involved with small businesses. I predominantly work with small businesses because as you all are sitting around here, that's what I have to work with. Um, once in a while I get involved in a larger business, but most of the time it's a mom and pop. So what is critical in that type of a situation is that you find somebody that has some commercial expertise. A residential broker that has their license knows how to sell some of them, knows how to sell a home. But when you get involved with profit and loss and depreciation and capital assets and all of this stuff, you're going to see a glaze come over their eyes as you're talking to them. And so I would encourage you to make sure you find somebody who has commercial background and has sold businesses in the past. And I think that that was one of the questions that you should ask an advisor. What have you sold? What have you got? What I can tell you is that because I work in a limited market, the statistic that Mike had used on the number of businesses listed to that has sold is a little bit different for me and in Franklin County. Generally, I sell 70 to 80 percent of the businesses that I sell because I'm dealing with a smaller product, I'm dealing with a smaller person. Most of them are individuals. I very seldom even get a call from a strategic or a financial buyer. But every once in a while, you work with a company and, and Franklin County is famous for having a small business get acquired by a large business. I mean, you can look at Light Light. Um, you can look at, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Heat Fab was a business that was bought by a larger company. So there's a lot of businesses that are being grown and will be acquired by the strategic and financial. And while I can help you with that, I might defer to somebody like Mike to come in and work with me. I know the local market. I know where to buy the bread and the liquor and the meat and potatoes. And I know the selectmen in the particular towns that are there. So there's a difference between that. So again, finding uh, the person as an intermediary or an advisor that knows the area and has a commercial background. Um, the other thing that was pointed out earlier, and I'm going to try and uh, kind of back some of the things that were presented before in the essence of, of time, is um, the professionals that you're going to use to try and help come up with the valuation of your business so that I can help sell it. And one of the things that you'll find is that if you have an accountant, the accountant you're providing your books to every year will have a valuation of your business. That valuation is at a certain level. And what I found very interesting as I've been working through the business sale part of it is that an accountant representing the seller will have a valuation of this. And then we bring the same numbers to an accountant representing the buyer and it always amazes me how that is a lot lower. So again, it depends on the person that you're going to be using and how you're going to be looking at it. But I need from you probably two to three years of profit and loss statements. The reason for that is, as pointed out earlier, there are fluctuations in your business. I would love to have you bring me those two to three years with that third year being better than the second year 
second year being better than the first year because it shows an ascending trend in your business. However, everything's not perfect. There are blips, and within that three-year period, you can have some dips and you can have some growth. But know that if your sales have dropped from the year before and you come to me to list that property, I'm not going to be able to get you that much because the question that the buyer is going to have is, are you going down the tubes? I'm not going to pay you a premium if your sales have gone down. So timing, again, mentioned earlier, is important. And if you have a few good years of growth in sales, it's a wonderful time to sell. And market will also be dictating when it's a good time to sell as well. People keep QuickBooks. People have their own accounting. <coughs> That's a lot of what I can take from you, but I also like to get the IRS forms, your Schedule C, if you have partnership forms, whatever. Those are the things that when a buyer makes an offer, they're going to ask for you to give them copies of those things. The QuickBooks, you can put whatever numbers you want on that. What you report to the government supposedly is the accurate numbers. And that's what the buyer a lot of times will ask for, for proof to verify what I'm putting forward on my APODs, and I'm going to pass out one of those in a little while. There's also the term that I call two sets of books. And it's a very delicate situation where a lot of the businesses that I might list are considered to be cash businesses. They're paid by cash, a restaurant. You, know, you come and you pay cash or you buy a widget at the store, you pay cash. <coughs> Some of the times the owners of that business may report something that may be something different. And I can't get involved in representation of anything but what you give me for numbers. And those numbers are, you're going to be needing to verify through your IRS forms that you file with the government. If there's another set of books that you keep, and it's not something that I infrequently run into. I have a lot of sellers that tell me, oh yeah, we've got a whole other set of books that we keep. What I do is I may take the information that you tell me is accurate, but it's going to have to be verified between the buyer and the seller. And I do that in a private meeting. I close you in a room. I tell you to talk. I don't want to be there and you come up with your own conclusions after that. But know that when a bank is involved, the bank doesn't care about what that second set of books is. They're going to need verification through the IRS forms to verify what I've put out on an APON. And I will only put out what I can verify on paper. So just some of the things to be aware of. Um, you also have to make a decision on the marketing of your business. A lot of times I'll be called in and somebody will say, I don't want this to become public. I want you to sell this particular business. No one should know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little bit of a difficult task at that point. So we have a discussion and we put it on for marketing in places that the typical person, the everyday person, is not going to know about. Um, but it does limit you. And there's the other part that somebody will say, I don't care who knows. I've been in this business long enough, it's doing really well. And then we can do what's called more public marketing. And a lot of times I will contact our local paper, the recorder, and I will leak to the recorder, <coughs> you know, so and so is getting ready to sell their business after 55 years in the business. And you could just hear you know, the, the radar going up. And it becomes an article in the paper, and you'll see them often in the paper. I've leaked some of those, not all of them, um, with the permission of the seller. And they're interviewed. And the thing that I encourage the seller to say is, don't focus on anything negative, but you know why you're selling. It's a good time to sell. My sales are up. 
It's all positive information that the everyday buyer is going to read and say, oh, they're getting out because they want to go travel and they want to do this and they want to do that. As opposed to saying, well, my sales you know, are down 20%, competition's coming into the area and I'm having difficulty keeping help. You know, there's a whole lot of things that you stay away from. So those can be tactically released in that public marketing. Um, and it does help because no matter what websites I go on and I put information that I have, biz buy, sell, multiple listing service, a lot of those people that are looking for businesses will go to those sites. But a lot of these businesses that you own, that I market, are general public will be sitting at their kitchen table reading the paper and say, wow, that would really be a great business to own. And then they start talking. And that's where you might get the local buyers. Probably 90 to 95% when the question was asked earlier comes from local people that are in this area already. Honestly, because the businesses that you might have to sell are not going to be multi-million dollar sales, multi, you know, six-figure bottom line incomes. So no one's going to move from California where they're making two or three hundred thousand dollars a year to come to Franklin County and make sixty. But the people that are here that don't have to sell their homes, that <coughs> find the business to be interesting, that have cash and credit backing to be able to do something like this, are more are more likely buyers that I find coming into this market and who I usually work with. So what Mike had pointed out earlier is determination of value is critical for the saleability of a business. And I don't know if I have enough, so if you just pass these around. I can make copies. Yeah, where you can share if, if you're sitting next to somebody you want to share with. And again, this is the APOD that I was talking about before, the Annual Property Operating Data Sheet. And I take these from usually the most recent um, profit and loss QuickBooks. And I analyze, I take out things that I don't think are appropriate, and I put them forward in an APOD. This is handwritten because I did it a couple of days ago and my secretary went out. Um, and this is of an actual business that was sold in Franklin County. And what I look at is the income and expenses of the particular businesses as they're reported. And I also back out, um, if you look halfway down, and, and I apologize for those that don't have them yet, if you back out the owner's salary, the reason why I do that is because if I'm going to be selling it to a buyer who's going to take over as ownership, that's going to be the income that they're going to get. So rather than taking a multiplier of the, the number of gross sales, the EBITDA, you said, okay. or the seller's income. What I do is I figure out income and expense, I take out the owner's sale, I take out things that I look at that are perks that the owner has at that point to make it a little bit more of a realistic number. And I go all the way down through, and what I come up with is a net operating income, which is income minus the expenses. And then I figure out, all right, based on the debt and how much I think will be able to be financed in this transaction, what will the annual debt service be on that kind of a business? So again, this sold for 285000 I figured that there would be a, about $200,000 worth of debt that could be placed on the property. That debt is figured as $1,429 a month times 12 months would be the annual debt service that's down in line 33, and I subtract that from the net operating income. And then the cash flow before taxes is what an owner can expect for this type of a business. And 
the $19,266 being a conservative number is not an exciting number. You aren't going to have people come forward and say, oh, I want to pay you $285,000 for this business so I can make $20,000 a year and work 60 to 80 hours a week. But when you're selling a business with real estate, that makes a big difference in an asset that A, a bank will finance, B, if your business is successful in that real estate, it makes that real estate more valuable. And as long as you maintain and upkeep that building in a reasonable condition, then it's something that will appreciate over time as well. And therefore, that particular buyer will look at it from the standpoint of what can my potential be. So it's a little bit different. And I know Mike had said before, when you're and you would ask the question about future earnings, um, in small businesses, it becomes a little bit more at play, where a buyer is going to say, you know, I've been in the food business, I've done this, this, and this, uh, I'd like to buy this restaurant because I want to be my own boss, I'm buying the real estate so I can be in control of my occupancy costs, it's in a really great location so that that business is going to continue to grow. and. I've got kids that are coming up, I might want to have involved in the business. There's a whole lot of different things that play into it. And they will look and see what exists now and what we can pay and make that work in a reasonable basis. So that's some of the things that I do with regards to evaluation from the APOD. But then you have equipment, inventory, and goodwill. Goodwill is one of these factors that somebody may be willing to pay you for your business value because of what they can generate later on. That's kind of the future potential of, of how I analyze it. The inventory, typically what I do is state that the inventory will be purchased at your cost. So that's over and above what you're paying for the value of the business and the real estate. And that is generally taken at the time of the closing. So the day of the closing or the day before the closing, the business shuts down, an inventory is taken, and it's your cost. I've had a lot of people <laughs> have tried to get the retail cost for that, but that's not happening. Um, so it's their cost, the wholesale cost, of what they've paid for that equipment and in the inventory. And then the equipment, generally I'll prepare an equipment list of what's going to be included with that particular sale. And I ask the seller to value that equipment as, you know, they bought it for $10,000, it's five years old, it's worth 5000 now. So they generally get that valuation. And that's an equipment list that goes along with the memorandum of offering, so it's offered out there to somebody and they can figure out what they're buying for equipment. It doesn't matter how much equipment you have and whether you just bought something brand new specifically, because that equipment is necessary to generate the sales that you have. So it all boils down to sales. And it boils down, in my estimation, in the way I prepare, is the bottom line of what somebody's going to be able to use that equipment to generate an income for themselves and their partners that are coming into the business. Yes? How much was the asking price on the business, and how long did this business take to sell? I think that it initially was listed at 350 for real estate and business. And then we probably had, over the course of six months, we probably had eight to ten showings on the property. And this was the only offer that was presented probably after that six months. And so we negotiated and were able to put that together. And when you get involved with the post-closing things, it, it spreads it out and it takes, you know, so it's upwards of a year from the, the date of initial listing to the uh, end of sale. So the negotiations that occur between the seller and the buyer generally run through the intermediary. It would either be Michael or me in this type of a situation. We keep you guys apart. And there's a reason for that is that, you know, as he said earlier, it's your baby, it, you know, you 
take offense to anybody that doesn't want to pay you top dollar for that. So we act as that intermediary and we work out those negotiations and I do it through a letter of intent. It's a very simple letter, non-binding letter that sets out the parameters and we negotiate that. And then once we get the letter of intent signed and agreed to, that's when we have the conditions that are in part of that letter of intent that kick in immediately. And usually it's subject to verification of income and expenses, which the verification is through that those IRS forms, the Schedule E, the partnership forms, whatever else you have to produce. So I usually ask for those up front, for you to give me three years I have in the file. And once the buyer that I've entered into a confidentiality agreement with settles on that letter of intent, then they go from reading my A file of what you have in front of you to actually seeing tax forms. Or that's when I put them in a room and they can talk to the seller by themselves and I look and see whether they're smiling when they come out or they're not smiling when they come out and then we have to go from there. But again, that financing, if it's bank financing, is going to be credit based on the IRS forms that, that you're going to be getting. Yes. This property and business sold and combined for about 80% of asking price. Mm -hmm. Do you find that to be typical in Franklin County? Um, I think Mike said there's 80% yeah. difference. And that's nationally right now. Nationally yeah. right yeah. now. Um, so do you find that typical in Franklin County for a business and real estate combination? Is one higher than the other? Like does real estate sell at less than 80% and businesses sell at more than 80% mm -hmm. and that's what drives? Typically real estate, right now the MLS statistics, if you look at real estate, that's residential and commercial, are probably 92% of asking price. It's about 8%, which is very typical to what you're oh, yeah. national. Yeah. Business, on the other hand, is a very fluid all number. All over the map. It's all over the map. Um, but generally, and what I do is I'll tell people, I'll do this for them, tell people what I think it should be listed for. Very seldom does the seller say, oh, that's a great price, let's do that. Well, we were expecting more, and I always say as long as it's not dramatically more, I'll try it. But I want you to hear what I'm telling you, that the buyer is going to analyze it very similar to the way I'm analyzing it. So be prepared for that. So on this property, you know, we listed it, as I mentioned, for 350 if that buyer came to me and said, I want to put it on the market for 500 I'd refuse the listing. They came to me, and, and I may have, I don't remember, because it was probably three years ago, four years ago, I may have told them it was worth between 250 and 275 When we negotiated and we got 285 we were able to put the transaction together because, again, they heard the number. and. It all depends on the activity that we have. If we have multiple offers that come in, you're going to be in a much stronger position to negotiate, specifically on the business value, uh, because you've got more than one person that's interested in it. I don't run into the multiple offers very often in business opportunities. Uh, residential real estate right now in this market is, is seeing multiple offers because there's a limited amount of inventory that's out there. So that answer your questions. Yes. Um, if it started at three fifty, so the business was three fifty. Is that was that one fifty a multiple of something? I'm just like, where did the one like for the asking price of three fifty, the real estate being two, was the one fifty a computation of one of them? Like, where did the one fifty come from? Like, is this the difference between the two hundred thousand valuation on real estate and the three fifty asking price. Right, right, right. So there's some value associated with the business on top of the real estate. Can I just look at how did you come up with the one fifty? I'd hazard a guess at that. Is that Mark actually said two hundred for the real estate, eighty five for the business, and that the seller came back and said. But I want to have well, 350 for it. Okay, I see. Is that? Yeah. Is that's not how you get okay. okay. the right, right, I, I, I thought it was looking. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And that's what I had said earlier is that I'll give them my price. So the difference could be the seller had wanted us to start at and what we ended up at. So there's some flexibility in that. How it's broken down is actually 
an accounting thing. Sometimes with a biz, the buyer goes in and says, you know, I'm going to give you 285. This is how I want it broken down. And they break it down because the goodwill is non-depreciable. So they're going to put as high a value as they can on the real estate because you can, you're allowed to take that depreciation. So it's just kind of playing with the numbers and, and the bank needs to verify through an appraisal what that real estate would be worth as well because that's what the bank is holding as, as a battle. I've got another question that I don't know which one of the two of you would be better to feed this question. But. So if you had a hypothetical business, I've got this friend. <laughs> that's how they usually we start. Love friends. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so if you've got a business that has good numbers, mm -hmm. but has no assets, mm -hmm. a lot of what drives this business is with the owners. Mm -hmm. To sell this business, there's not a lot there that's mm -hmm. sellable. Mm -hmm. But if this business was combined with real estate, mm -hmm. that would probably make that hypothetical business a lot more sellable or a lot more tangible. And it's more financeable. Too. Financeable. That's the word I was struggling with. Mm -hmm. so I, I think, think, yeah, I would, I would set, disagree with, with, with that to some level is that the business value is ultimately the business value and the real estate is the, is the, is the real estate um, <coughs> value on that. Um, mm -hmm. Unless the real estate is a critical component of the operation of the business, you know, it's going to get treated treated as such. Uh -huh. um, you know, so to his point, a restaurant, you know, yeah, you may be able to get a little bit more because there's a, uh, on the price because the real estate's owned, it's, and that's where you build the, the, the equity in a, in a restaurant business is owning the real estate, so. Right. Versus a, a lease location. If this was a lease location, you know, he may, probably wouldn't have sold. That was my point. Yeah. Right. And that's the yeah. point that I usually ask if it's under a lease type of a situation. <coughs> I need to see the lease, how many options you have on the lease to renew, how critical your particular location is to the running of your business. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, if your lease is coming up next year, how it's, plan plan that lease and is. it's critical that you be there, you need to negotiate that lease to extend it out five, ten years, have some options after that and now you've got something to sell. But if you don't have control of where your location is, you're putting the new buyer in a disadvantage because if you're successful there, it comes up for renegotiation and that, sell, that landlord has you over a barrel. Right. Yeah, great, great example is um, Loose Goose Cafe in uh, Amherst. If you're familiar with that, we had that as a listing. We had a buyer in place and then they um, were basically informed that we're tearing down this plaza <laughs> and we're going to build something else. So. And, and, and my client, Luzco, said they, they had owned the location, but it was a condo situation and they didn't have the boat. So we went from having a business sale uh, of X to, well, he got his price on his real estate. And that was, that was it. Mm -hmm. So locate, you know, control of that location is critical to the sale of certain businesses. Right. So the negotiations part, we, we go to the letter of intent. We have the conditions put in the letter of intent of what the buyer wants to see what they have to do. It might involve bringing it to particular municipalities to get the permits <coughs> transferred. There's a lot of those things that are put in the letter of intent, which we start working on initially. And then it goes to a, a formal agreement of purchase where there might be an asset purchase and there may be a business purchase. There's two different agreements and that's where you get attorneys involved as part of the team. And what I found interesting what Mike had said, you know, you want to make sure that you get a business attorney to do it. Well, like me, I am a jack of all trades in Franklin County. I handle anything commercial, even though I may not have been trained for it. So what you want to find is you want to find, and what, what Mike had said earlier as well, is one that is at least a good negotiator. Um, one that has done some businesses in the past, but you probably will not find a business specialist in Greenfield that does that and make their living specifically on businesses. There just isn't enough. 
business around here to do that. So just find somebody that you feel comfortable with will make the sale because it is a deal breaker if you don't have somebody who's willing to work and make this thing happen. So, you know, look for that. We also will work with local banks and work with the CDC to try and get the financing package together, which is again a critical component. And sometimes, as was mentioned earlier, we have to ask the seller for a commitment to make this transaction work. It's a, an endorsement that I believe this business is going to be successful, but it doesn't go without risk because you know that the business can be successful. You've run it and it's been successful for you. You sell it to somebody else and they want you to help finance it and they run it into the ground in the first six months. Your seller held mortgage is greatly at risk at that point, so it is a risk. So you as the seller want to be very, very confident that the buyer has got the capability and the skill to be able to continue to operate that business at least for the term of what your mortgage is going to be if, if uh, you're holding a note on it. So, and sometimes it's the only way we can make a transaction happen. Again, the CDC has been wonderful whenever we get a bank that's involved and they say we're only going to give you X, the buyer we know has Y, and we come to the CDC for the balance and a lot of times they can make that work. <coughs> the CDC won't talk to you unless you go see Amy first <laughs> and say you've got to have a business plan. So again, when we have buyers that come in that we're working with and they have a particular interest in a particular business, we have them call Amy and say, you know, you've got to develop a business plan. You offer courses in this type of thing, but you know, a lot of times we can do some counseling and assessment so that that buyer can produce a business plan based on the income and expense information that we've given them as to what they're going to be doing. And once they have the business plan in effect, it's more financeable from the bank. The CDC now has met their requirement that they at least have an idea of what they thought about what they're going to be doing in the future, and we may be able to put that financing together. And then we bring it up to the closing. And as I said, it can take anywhere from six months to a year based on the conditions that are in there and what you have to accomplish. Um, and what we typically do is, as I mentioned before, we have the inventory counting as the day of the closing. We have transfers of licenses, it could be liquor licenses, it could be business operating licenses, whatever else we have we have been working on, those all get transferred as of the day of the closing. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is the transition. A lot of times, and I'll build this into a letter of intent specifically if I feel it's necessary for the seller to have a relationship with a buyer to ensure success, that I'll ask for the seller to provide training for a limited period of time and it can be either compensated or non-compensated. It's all part of the negotiation. But you know your business better than anybody else. The buyer coming in <coughs> wants to get off on the right foot, so what we may have, a couple of things can happen. It can either be um, right before the closing, the buyer comes in to the operation of the business before the closing, and we try and make it very, very limited. Uh, but the seller shows the buyer introduces the buyer to some of their vendors, goes to visit some of the people that they do business with, introduces them, and has that period. Um, typically, we try and do that prior to the closing so that the closing is terminated and the, the buyer's on their own. Sometimes it exists after the closing as well, and it can be fairly sizable investment from the seller to say, yeah, I'm going to work 20, 30 hours a week in this business to show you I'm going to work for two weeks. And typically in that type of a situation, we will also negotiate pay for the seller because, you know, if, if you are selling a business and you're putting in that much time to train, we can negotiate the pay unless you've got a really good price and you're just really happy and you're going to do it for nothing. So those are all negotiable items as well. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is a non-compete. When you buy a business, 
you don't want the owner of that business after they sell it to you to open up next door and sell the same thing. Probably would ruin your day if that happened after you just paid them some money for that. You're asking them to sell you their business and you're asking them to non-compete, to not compete against you directly. And that takes the form of a written document as usually part of the agreement that the attorneys negotiate and it will usually be a radius of around the property that you're selling and it will usually be for a period of time. Those are the things that you have to be prepared for and a lot of sellers always tell me, you know, I'm getting out of this business, I don't want to go back in this again, so, but that's fine. The buyer needs to have that protection that you're not going to and be involved in anything to compete with the sale of the business. So just something to be aware of when you go forth and, and so that you will normally be asked for non-compete. And at that, I just tried to roll everything in. Any? Is there an average length of time for a non-compete? Depends on the type of business that you sell. It can be anywhere from two to five years. We typically see five. We see five. Yeah. And you usually see I mean, in Franklin County, you're so spread out, it might be 50 miles. Mm -hmm. In Springfield, it could be three miles. Right. So it depends on where you are. Do you see any trends right now that um, we are in 2017 in commercial real estate in Franklin County? I always say, and I'll take exception to what Mike had pointed out before, saying that businesses are emotional. I do residential and commercial because there aren't enough businesses in Franklin County to support my needs, so I continue to do residential. I've always felt that residential has been more of an emotional decision and that the commercial buyers that I work with, it's to the numbers. It's basically numbers. And to answer your specific question, the trends are that commercial real estate business opportunities are typically economy related that if the market if the economy is growing and healthy it's usually an upbeat type of a pricing strategy but we just went through from 2008 to 2015 you know a drop in the economy um, commercial real estate was really just kind of hovering some of it was losing value business opportunities we would have a pocket every once in a while if some business opportunities during that period of time thrived for one reason or another. So whatever that business is doing, if the business is doing well, the market, as long as you can find somebody that has cash, <laughs> because the financing part of it, the banks are a little bit more cautious in a tightening market or whatever. But I always look at it, and as I, I said before, I look at it and what it's going to generate for income right now. and how that gets financed and how that gets put together and whether it's cash won't make the difference. But we're seeing the trends right now in an upward sense. The economy is kind of stabilizing. Um, I will not go out on a limb and say that that's going to continue because there's just <laughs> too much out there right now <laughs> that could change that. But, you know, I do find it a little bit up. Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of activity. Yep. So it's a good thing. And that's why we can take the time out of our schedules to, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank to you present. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank, Thank you all. Great information. Thank you.